to the North Fork of the Coeur d'Alene WAG meeting, our first meeting of 2023. We saw you guys last week in December uh, last year, so good to see you all. Um, today we have, a, I'm going to pull this off to the side for a sec and bring it back. We have an exciting agenda. Um, so introductions first, and then we're going to have Craig Nelson um, talk to us about our BERT monitoring program, which is a DEQ program. Um, very cool stuff. And then we have Carlos from Idaho Fish and Game to talk about fisheries monitoring in the North Fork, which will be a good transition um, into a little discussion about where we're at with our restoration field trip planning. Um, so this is going to be our last inside meeting for a while. Our next two meetings are going to be um, field trips. So we're going to just touch base on that and um, still have some details to figure out about it, but um, we have some nice flyers, save the date flyers made that I'll pass out. Then go into a uh, septic subcommittee update, um, just talk a little bit more about concerns about septic systems and black water in the North Fork. Then it's really just open discussion and group updates and um, adjourning the meeting, so pretty easy. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with introductions. My name is Lily Conrad. You've probably gotten some emails from me. I'm a water <coughs> analyst with DEQ in the Coeur d'Alene Regional Office. And maybe we can go to Matthew and then snake our way that way. I'm Matthew Calling. I'm the IPDS Compliance Officer for the DEQ in the Coeur d'Alene Regional Office. Carlos Camacho, Regional Fisheries Biologist. Uh, I work by Fishing Game. I kind of have Coeur d'Alene, all of the Spokane Basin, including the North Fork, is in the area that I oversee. Um, Ed Leiter, local fly fisherman. I'm Jeff Zimmerman, Shoshone County Commissioner, District 3. Um, I'm Emily Persis, and I'm with NRCS. I'm Chris Robinson, hydrologist on the Coeur d'Alene River Ranger District of the Canyon National Forest. I'm Wade Jerome, I'm the uh, forest restoration biologist here on the Idaho Panel National Forest. Uh, Jim Devlin, I'm in the Fisher Murray Volunteer Fire Department up in the north. Hi, I'm Todd Higgins. I am a watershed analyst also out of the Coeur d'Alene Regional Office, mm -hmm. and I am also a local fly fisherman. Uh, Tyson Klein, Environmental Health and Safety Manager at Sunshine Mine. Uh, Craig Nelson, I work at Idaho Department of Environmental Quality, Coeur d'Alene Region, and uh, coordinate the stream monitoring. And our region is what St. Joe up to the border, <laughs> so Panhandle. Um, uh, Rodney Cochran, Idaho Department of Lands, Forester. Oh, sure. Hi, my name is Ryan. I work with Panhandle Health District. I'm the uh, the Environmental Health uh, Inspector for Shoshone County. <laughs> I'm Jesse Brown. I'm in the Critical Materials Program with Panhandle Health District. Hmm. I'm Rob Archer, uh, Vice President of the Friends of the River Coalition. Ted Clark, uh, Friends of the River Coalition, avid fly fisherman too, so, so is he. <laughs> Don Wixton, uh, <coughs> founder of the Friends of the River Coalition, and uh, I'm the tag along, not so great fly fisherman. <laughs> I'm more the boat person. <laughs> awesome. So we'll go ahead and go to the folks online. Um, Phil, would you like to go first? Phil Lillibridge, engineer with the Idaho Soil and Water Conservation Commission. Thanks, Phil. Sharon? Uh, good morning, uh, or afternoon. Sharon Bosley with the University of Idaho Community Water Resource Center. Thanks, Sharon. Felicia? Peter Cassidy, also science and engineering and local resident and user of the river. Great. Uh, Jedediah? <coughs> Hi, uh, Jedediah Friedman. I work on the Idaho Panhandle National Forest. I'm the Coeur d'Alene River Ranger District Recreation Staff Officer. Great. Kristen? Good afternoon. I'm Kristen Lowell. I'm with DEQ, um, analyst here at Coeur d'Alene Office. Thanks, Kristen. Mark? Hey, 
good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mark Elliott with the uh, Coeur d'Alene Region DEQ. I'm the Source Water Protection Analyst. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. And Rebecca? I'm sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Rebecca Stevens, Coeur d'Alene Tribe uh, Restoration Coordinator with the partnership and represents the tribe on Superfund related issues. And uh, I wouldn't call it fishing, I'd call it trying. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, I think that was everyone online. Um, so we'll go ahead and dive right into our meeting. Up first is Craig with the BERT program, and Craig put together a really great story map for his presentation, so I'll go ahead and... Are you gonna control it? Do you want, I can give you my mouse and... Oh, you can control it. Yeah, okay. don't mind. sure. Yeah, we kind of have a theme going on with Carlos and I, and it's macroinvertebrates and fish. And we're talking about the life that's in the stream. Uh, macroinvertebrates are actually insects that you can see with your naked eye. And they're great trout food. So we'll start out with Beneficial Use Reconnaissance Program. Great acronym that makes up a word, BERP, so you can remember it easy. And that picture on the right there is uh, Granite Creek up in Priest area but uh, Todd pointed out it's in Washington. <laughs> but it's still a, a beautiful view. <laughs> so I'll start out with kind of the history, or well, the purpose and history of this program that is kind of unique to uh, Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, it started in 1993, and DQ implemented the Beneficial Use Reconnaissance Project with efforts aimed at integrating biological monitoring with physical habitat assessment to characterize stream integrity and water quality. So it started as a pilot project and was developed to meet the Clean Water Act requirements of monitoring and assessing biology and developing bio criteria. So it kind of focuses on the beneficial use of aquatic life. Uh, the project relied heavily on monitoring. Yeah, relied heavily on monitoring physical habitat and macroinvertebrates, and followed protocols developed in the 1990s by Idaho State University (DEQ) and EPA's Rapid Bioassessment Protocols for use in streams and rivers, benthic macroinvertebrates, and fish. Using the best science and understand available to characterize water quality on the basis of biological communities and their attributes. Uh, the successful uh, pilot project expanded into a statewide in 1994 and you'll see there's some names in there and one of them is still currently employed by DEQ and is my boss. <laughs> so Bob Steed. So that was all the way back in 1995. Uh, and then BERP has remained in statewide use and in 2000 it had a name change and it went to Beneficial Use Reconnaissance Program uh, because it was more permanent uh, it, but it didn't change the acronym it's just a bonus still BERP uh, currently there's over 10,000 sites that have been sampled in Idaho uh, making DEQ a national leader in bioassessment. And if you scroll, uh, I think you might have to expand this, but this is kind of a visual of all the dots in Idaho where BERP has been sampled. And it basically forms the shape of Idaho. You see a little area that's wilderness and then the Snake River Plain. But there's a lot of sites out there. And that's interactive. At the end of this, we can email out this story map to everyone. But you can click on one of those dots, and a window will pop up. Oh, there we go. See that window will pop up, and you have a data link that goes right to all the, the burp data for that site. And this data, you can Google it's on the internet. You can just do an internet search of BERP viewer, and it'll bring that up. Uh, I think the next 
I'm gonna be, we'll go into that in a second, but if you go back to the, the map there, there is six regions in Idaho. Uh, so there's Coeur d'Alene region, and then there's uh, Lewiston, Boise, Idaho Falls, Twin Falls, Pocatello. But each of those regions have a burp crew, and that crew is three individuals, and they work uh, throughout the summer, and they collect or budgeted for 40 samples, 40 sampled sites per year. And that uh, field season is July 1st and can go through October 15th. But usually they have 40 sites sometime in September usually. But we like that window because if you're doing comparisons, you know, you're looking at the macro invertebrates, so you want year to year comparison. So here's that uh, internet view of all the data. This is organized by calendar year. And you can click on 2021. And then it'll bring up all the sites that were collected in Idaho in that year. And a good one to look at, you scroll down. <coughs> See if you can scroll to the Coeur d'Alene. On the list? Yeah, there's a, a bar that you can scroll oh, down. There you go. So you can scroll down that, and I think there was a granite gulch. Or, yeah, so see the burp site ID on the left? Starts with the year, mm -hmm. and then it goes into the region, and then it's sequential number. Another way you can do it is geographically with uh, zoom in zoom into like the North Fork area I'll pick a site in the North Fork see that Murray one with the three uh, click on Granite Gulch which is to the left of that one um, in that cluster so you can click that and, and it'll take you to all the data that's collected for that burp site. And the tabs on the left, if you scroll back up there, see those tabs on the left each have uh, data for that type. So location, then you have sample metadata. That gives information on the macroinvertebrates when they were collected, who collected them, and then the test sampler was used. And then you scroll down, there's the fish survey, and then there's some comments there. Uh, amphibians present, abundant tadpoles. So it kind of just gives you some of the details there. And then stream, stream tab. So I'll just briefly go over this, but you can always call or email me. There's the physical properties, so the air temperature, water, conductivity, pH, and then the stream characteristics. And you can go to flow, and that's the discharge measurement. So there's a lot of data that's collected when they're out there. So about two and a half CFS or granite gulch. And then there's a bunch of other physical measurements. There's a pebble count, which is like profiling the substrate sizes across the channel. Uh, habitat. And then there's the, see the macros? If you click on the bugs, we don't actually identify them out in the field. They're collected and then sent to a lab in Moscow and they identify them down to the species or as far as they can go and then count them. And I think they stop at like a 500 count. Uh, I don't know the Latin names, so what I do is copy that and you can paste it into a Google search and it'll tell you what it is. So see that 99? And I won't pronounce it, that's a mayfly. And there's quite a few mayflies and if you're a fly fisherman, you'll know 
it's mayfly, caddisfly, stonefly, and there's a lot of those in here. So, but I Google those and it'll tell you what it is. Uh, but that's all the bug data. And then there's the fish. You can click on the fish tab. And the fish survey is a backpack of electrofishing, a single pass. And then if you scroll down, you can see what was captured and measured. And it was cedar sculpin. There was 38 of them. You could expand that out and see all their sizes. And then what was the other one? Cutthroat? Yeah. 12 cutthroat. And then their sizes. And then the gallery. If you hit the gallery, the last tab, you can see <coughs> photos of the site, which are really good visuals to help put it together. You can click on one of those and it'll open them up. Click on one of them. And it's an upstream, downstream, and a panoramic at the start of the site but it gives you a good visual of the riparian area. So all this data is collected, and then at the end, uh, Lily, if you scroll up, there's a summary report on the right, upper right there. The way this is scored is it's bits and pieces of that data, so it's parameters. Like an example would be in the bugs, it's the percent EBT, which is that percent mayfly, caddisfly, stonefly of the community, of the group. So you can think of it that way. It's pulled out in pieces of it, not the raw data scored, but it's a multi-metric indexing score. And when this comes up, when it comes up there, I'll show you, it's compared to a group of reference sites for that ecoregion. Usually it'll come up with the, the burp site scoring on this. So you can see that uh, that site class, most of North Idaho is mountains. There is down in the valleys, uh, it's called foothills. But you see this M SMI2, the M is macroinvertebrate. I just think of the M macroinvertebrate, F is fish, and the next one, H is habitat. So it's categorized into three bins there. And that score is compared to a group of reference streams, which are the low human impacted sites. And then you either get, based off how it's divided, a one, two, or a three. One meaning, uh, you know, somewhat good, two meaning good, three meaning best. And those three bins are then averaged for a site condition rating. And that far right is the site condition rating. And you'll see that uh, a two or greater is a passing score, it's a pass-fail, um, but a two or higher is a passing score. If it's under that two, then it's showing that that beneficial use is stressed somehow uh, and the stream is impaired for, for aquatic life beneficial use. Does water temperature or flow rate affect those scores? So, so if you show up when the water is a year where the water at that site is colder than usual and the flow is different. Yeah, and that's kind of why we have our uh, field season July 1st to uh, September or October. Because you're trying to base it off the summer low flow. Now, I think last year we did have a pretty good flow early in the season. But you put that in comments. You put it in the comments for e-fishing that, you know, uh, high velocity, difficult to uh, capture fish. Mm -hmm. So you're putting those details in there uh, to help, when we do look at this score, help explain it. Okay. So, um, 
But yeah, the variability is what you're trying to get away from, but there's always variability in nature. So Craig, do you uh, tea your fish in the field or do you take some into the lab? Uh, so the quality control on that would be you're, you're calling the species out in the field and you're measuring it and then you put them back alive, right? But every once in a while you'll voucher one, maybe one during the season that you say is a cutthroat and that validates all the others. Or if you don't know what it is, you voucher it. And vouchering it means you put a tag on it, put it in formalin, and then it's shipped down to an expert that identifies and validates it. Quality control on it. Sculpin, you definitely have to do them. Yeah, There's right. no way to identify them in the field. And they're really cool because if you put them in a white bucket, they all kind of uh, lose their color and change to one kind of gray or whatever. Uh, neat fish though. So that's just a brief way of looking at the data, showing you where it's found on the internet. Um, but if you have questions, I have my contact information if you want to dig into a specific site or dig into the details of the data. Uh, but here's also a place you can go and look. Everyone uses a field manual and there's very specific protocols on how we collect this data. And that is so you can compare it to years past or different areas of the state. So there's our field manual. Uh, and then you can uh, view that and see how the data is collected. But there, the whole, uh, all the crews in the state are trained uh, all as one group. So it's part of the quality control. Everyone learns it together, kind of calibrates, and then they go off and collect the data. Here's the important thing. This uh, season, we plan uh, quite a few streams within the North Fork Port Lane drainage. Uh, and this is our planned streams there, where we put the sites. Uh, I haven't done that yet. But these are the streams that are planned to visit this summer. This might tie into the field trip discussion. Uh, in the past, we have done uh, demonstrations for a day where you guys come out, see how the data is collected, and maybe do a bug sample or whatever, look at the bugs. Um, but, you know, we can do that in the discussion if you guys want to group together. We don't know where we're going to be week to week, but we can plan something and be there for you. Craig, how many sites does this represent? So the, the color coding on this is an assessment unit. So DEQ divides it up into assessment units. And when you do a burp site, that burp site is representing that color or that assessment unit. So, and it varies, you can do so there's some big assessment units of first and second order streams. That's kind of how they're divided. It's based off stream order and land use. So see that highlighted one is one assessment unit. We might do three burp sites within that assessment unit. Uh, but we want to make sure that site is representative of the whole assessment unit. Not like the worst area or the best, but a representative location in there. So this is a fair chunk of the 40 that are going to happen yeah. in this region. This might be half of what we have. We always project way over your 40 sample sites because you'll get to an area where you might not get access to it. There might be a wildfire in the area. Uh, if it's private property, you might not get permission or a stream is dry. But you uh, document that. If the stream is dry, you document it, but you don't sample it. Mm -hmm. So it's not part of your 40, but it's part of data collected. So this is our plan, and uh, yeah, that's probably half of our season plan. But you can uh, scroll around and look at those uh, whenever you feel like it. And then this is the list of them. There's two main reasons. Uh, we're doing probabilistic sampling where that design is randomly done on the stream layer of Idaho. 
and there's probably half a dozen that say random. Those, it's a specific point on the stream and we go visit and sample them. They may not be representative, but we put them in that it's a random site and we might not assess it because it's not representative. The other rationale is it's a regional priority, meaning this is ambient monitoring and it's been a long time since we've done these collected data on these streams. I think it was back in the 1990s or early 2000s. So we're just collecting data routinely. So here's some pictures uh, to give you a visual. That's a HES net, and that's how we sample the macroinvertebrates in the substrate. And you'll see it's kind of like a five gallon bucket made of stainless steel, and it's got a mesh in the front where the flow is coming through. And then it's got a cone mesh on the back with a sampler on the end of it. And you scrub all the substrate there and then uh, stir it up because those macroinvertebrates are on the rocks and underneath the waves. So you have to stir up that substrate. And the idea is you're putting it into the flow of water and then they're going down the cone and getting captured. So then we preserve that sample in ethanol alcohol in that jar there. And it's just a composite sampling. We do three of those samples per burp site and then send it off to the lab. There's a cool picture that Todd took of, that's caddis fly. You know how they make their little homes? That's a pretty good community right there. But I wanted to show a couple pictures of the macroinvertebrates. People make jewelry out of those and stuff. There's a stonefly nymph on waders. I didn't have too many pictures of macroinvertebrates. This is the, uh, the flow measurement or discharge, and we do that for every site. And then this is uh, kind of showing the, the pebble count that is done across the channel. And there's some large sizes there, but you're characterizing the sizes of those with a uh, uniform uh, distance all the way across. That is Wellington Creek, which is a tributary that goes into Lightning Creek. Really pretty uh, canyon there. Do you just do one pass or do you have a minimum number? So uh, there is a minimum number going across. You have to do 50 or more for one profile, but you might have to collect another run of it. But you can change your increment. You just have to go bankful to bankful with us. Uh, you know, a certain distance and you have to keep that standard. So you might hit a big rock three times, but uh, you're doing that same increment all the way across. If you don't get 50, then you step up and do another distance increment and collect at least 50 or more. And then that is done three times at a burp site. So in theory, you're getting over 150 recordings out of the sizes. It's a modified uh, Ullman pebble count. There's uh, just a picture showing uh, use of a densiometer. So we do canopy cover measurements and it's section quartered. So we do a left bank, right bank, upstream, downstream. And we do that three times, wait, six times throughout the reach. Uh, I, had to throw, I had to throw a picture of Todd in. Yeah. <laughs> that's Upper Priest River. Yeah, that's a yeah. gorgeous spot. Yeah, unique uh, pool feature. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a hot tub, it's a cold tub. Yeah, <laughs> that's cold Very water. Cold. <laughs> and then here's uh, electro fishing with the backpack unit. Um, kind of a fun uh, summer employment for college kids. Just wanted to show some pictures there. This right here, this is a, a North Fork Coeur d'Alene. Uh, this was captured on Shoshone Creek. It's a sculpin and it's six inches. That's a massive size granddaddy right there. I thought caught it. Yeah, 
out of the thousands we've caught, that's the biggest. <laughs> so what is it? A torrent, probably? Yeah, it's a torrent yeah. with two bands on the back. Mm -hmm. We just generalized it and called it a sculpin, but if we put that, I think we did put it in the jar. Maybe we did. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we didn't, because it's a grand that it's, yeah, we, we may have read that. You don't want to do it. <laughs> But the head on it's huge, so uh, usually if they're that size, we let them go again, and we only do like vouchering of like an intermediate size. This thing lived this long; we want to keep it living. So plus we, I think we probably caught about 600 sculpin that day too, so we had plenty to choose from. <laughs> um, Rebecca online asked, "Is there a very slick Craig? Nice work." Oh, yeah. uh, it's a fun job, so I've been doing it 10 years and love working with the people collecting the data. What's electrofishing? Uh, if you go back to that picture there, it is instead of fishing with like, you know, a hook and flies, you're using electricity to stun them and net them to capture them. Now that electrical field, you have a negative rat tail that comes off that backpack. And then there's a wand as your positive, and you're creating a field in the water to kind of stun them. Then you, you have a certain amount of time where you capture them with nets, put them in the bucket there, mm -hmm. and then you move up, up the stream. And then you identify and measure them, put them back in the stream. But it's a effective method. Uh, you can use your, your uh, hooks, but this capture a sculpin and every fish that's in there to some degree. It's still not super efficient. We might only capture a small portion, but we get an idea of the species that are in there and some of their size classes. You said you do a, a single pass. Single pass, so it's more presence absence. It looks your stream length that you actually... So the stream length is based off the bank full width. It's 30 times bank full width or a minimum of 100 meters or more. So if your bank full is three meters, you have to do at least 100 meters. Now, this one, uh, the Granite Gulch was 195 meter reach length. And we electrofish all that, all habitat types. So we're getting, you know, an idea of the species that are in there. So, we always ran at very conservative settings too. Yeah. So, we didn't want to harm anything. I think yeah. that's the end of the story, Matt. Yeah. If you guys have questions or... Uh, well, make sure you can yeah. access this yeah. after the meeting if you want to take a look at any of the pictures or read more about the BERT program um, on your own time. But are there any questions for Craig, both online or in person? I'd like to give him a quick plug. I started off as a burper, and it was a great experience. A burper. A burper. Burper. Yeah. 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 Um, burper. yeah. It's a combination. If you ever know any college age kids looking for a scientific summer field bird job, you can't beat this job. Um, it's super fun. You're out camping and fishing all summer. But the scientific experience you get was just invaluable. Yeah. So, it's a lot of diversity of stuff that you're collecting. So as far as knowledge base, you're gaining a lot. You get to play around with a lot of different instruments. You're not just doing one thing all summer. It's a diversity of stuff. Yeah. And this is a pretty nice region. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so Greg, this you might not recall, but this is pre-COVID. We were looking at a site up in Independence Creek. Oh yeah. In um, Snowshoe Meadows. Was that ever re-looked at because basically it failed? Yeah. The watershed passed and it failed and we were gonna go look at it and then... Yeah, and I thought, uh, I don't know, Forest Service was gonna look at it. I remember Todd and I went in there and it was brutal to get in there. And we said, we're only gonna collect data on this once. And then it failed. Mm -hmm. And then we haven't made an assessment on it yet. We're still gathering info. So, yeah, because we were, when Kaiser was still working, yeah, we were gonna have a field trip into it and, Ooh, and yeah. look at it because it was different than yeah. all the other sites. It was that meadow site, 
Yeah, and it was five mile hike in. On the and bottom, we, but he yeah. didn't come in off the top. Well, we came in off the top. Yeah. And it was five miles in and we were in waders. Oh. It's fine going in in the morning, <laughs> but when we were coming out, it was brutal. And yeah, and we said, oh, we're never coming back here again. <laughs> 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 and then it failed. We have to put that on the list, so he has to go back. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, thanks. But we do have an audit every year. We'll just put it on our audit and make sure someone else joins us. Tackle or waders. We thought it'd be amazing because it's so remote, yeah. but it turned out it was like a uh, sea channel and it wasn't as fascinating as we were predicting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're kind of lacking in habitat and didn't have great fish or bugs. It's a five yeah. mile hike in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, it was pretty neat too because we had a bear sitting there watching us the whole time on the bank and like the moose sailing around. Yeah. yeah. Right into a cougar on the way. But They're the only ones that like the hike. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we were hiking out and getting back to the vehicles, and that cougar growled in the shrubs. <gasps> We were so exhausted, we just kept moving <laughs> back to the truck for water. Yeah, then it sprayed my tail. <laughs> but fun stories, fun times. Yeah. But uh, that data is critical for a lot of surface water stuff it needs to. Uh, it's a major data collection statewide, and it covers a lot of the streams, the weightable streams uh, encompass most of the miles of streams in Idaho. So, pretty important program. Mm -hmm. And you guys are coming to the North Fork this yeah. year, which is very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully we're able to figure something out and link up on yeah. one of our field trip dates. Yeah, that would be really cool to see. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Craig. Oh, yeah. um, appreciate you putting that story map together yeah. and taking the time to present to this group. Um, with that, kind of along similar lines, we're going to go ahead and, and shift over to Carlos. So I'll just let you control that. And here's a mouse if you want it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me here. I think it's been a while since uh, fisheries folks from Fish and Game have been to the North Fork WAG meeting. So I'm happy to step in and kind of highlight some of the things that we've been doing in the North Fork. Um, or for, as you see, we've been doing it for a quite some time now. Um, I think a lot of times we kind of fly under the radar. We're just out with our heads down getting some stuff done. So um, we'll just jump in here. Uh, so again, some of those highlights I wanted to hit was just kind of uh, briefly talk about our annual fish monitoring, um, some of the fish research we've done, habitat protection, and some of the future projects that we've, we've got going uh, on already. Um, so for our annual fish monitoring, um, we do what are called snorkel surveys, and this is a map here of all of our sites within the North Fork drainage here. Um, Enoville down here, which is kind of where we where we start. Oops, there we go. So Enoville down in here in this area, um, where we start, and we go all the way through the the main stem, all the way up to uh, the walk-in section up by going towards Jordan Creek. Um, but we also do the Little North Fork, TP Creek, and we've since included parts of Pritchard Creek, which I'll hit on that here in a little bit too. Um, and what it basically equates to when we hit all these sites in a given year, it's about 150,000 square meters of water surface area. To put that in perspective, that's about 27 football fields, end zone to end zone, sideline to sideline. So we're definitely covering lots of water on an annual basis. And kind of what that might look like. Uh, so we go out, we'll find our sites, we get our gear on, and then one lucky individual in this particular case gets to stick their face in. And as you're floating down, you're trying to go from upstream to downstream. You want to be as still as you can so you don't scare the fish. And you're scanning, you're not only counting all the fish, but you're also counting them by species and trying to get an idea of size as well. And then once you're all done with the snorkel survey, you'll actually take some course measurements, uh, habitat measurements of that section that you've just snorkeled. Kind of gives us an idea of how the river has changed over the years at these particular sites. Um, so from the view of the snorkeler, just a quick snapshot, <laughs> and fish are very good at hiding. And I'll give you a quick second to see if you can find any of the fish in here. 
Uh, if you counted <laughs> eight white fish in one cutthroat, then you're doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely it's not Whoa. easy, but much like the burp crew, we get our folks together. We do lots of training before we go out. We do some calibrating with our temp staff um, that comes in. That going back to you know, we also have a bunch of college kids that come out and get to do this for a summer too. So. Um, but we get them together and we do all the <coughs> training to not only identify species in the water, but get a really good idea of their size as well as, you know, what's the protocol for actually snorkeling. So, Carlos, how do you record that? Like on a... So, on what, we got a, we took a piece of PVC pipe and cut it in half and you make a little bracelet. And then you have a, a just a pencil on a rubber band. And a lot of times when oh. you're, when you're going through, you're using your fingers and toes. And then if you can find a spot where you can quickly write down if you've got too many fish, right. then you Aww. quickly jot them down and then continue snorkeling down through the right. hole. There are places where you definitely need that tablet and it is just jammed full. Um, and then there's other places where you can actually just use your hands. Um, so kind of, as I mentioned, we've been doing this for a while and some of these data sets go back to the uh, late 60s, early 70s. So I'm gonna kind of just go through um, for the North Fork quarter lane here. On the top panel, it's going to be uh, densities of all sizes of cutthroat. And then on the bottom panel is density of just those big cutthroats, so 12 inches and greater. And so for the quarter lane here, um, we can see, you know, way back earlier, there was a harvest season on cutthroat, and that was kind of deemed as one of the more um, one of the things that was suppressing the population and over the years there's been sequential uh, regulation changes that leads up to where we are now where it's catch and release for cutthroat throughout the drainage and you can see that over time there the the population did rebound or did come up and stayed up and now we're kind of getting into this this time period here in the last decade or so where we kind of we're at like an equilibrium and what we're seeing here is this bouncing around kind of an equilibrium and a lot of that bouncing is just nature, natural variation that's occurring in the system. Um, that's for the, the top and on the bottom, you can see that also our large fish uh, increase, our densities increased. It's a little lagged, which makes sense if you've got the little fish need time to grow up to be big fish. Um, so you can kind of see how it lags a little bit there. Uh, but one of the things you might be wondering, okay, well, how does this compare to some of the other streams that we have in the in the paint? Does a blank mean no survey, or are you surveyed and then find anything? Blank means no survey. Hmm. Um, it was a little, we were didn't do it as much early on as we do now. So, Carlos, when did catch and release go in? It was, for the quarter lane, it was, it was sequential, so there was... I think it first started in the upper section oh, gotcha. and then it kind of just worked its way down and I'm trying to remember. I remember the 80s yeah. not, not being there. Yeah, yeah, was like 90s, wasn't it? yeah I want to say it was in the 90s. I think it was like 85 most of the river was catch and release. Um, but it, it varied kind of like I said, it, so that sequential thing where first it was, you were allowed I think, I forget how many like pounds of fish at the, some of the first regulations. And then it went down to so many fish, and then so many fish of a size, as well as you could only harvest, uh, you can harvest anywhere, then only the middle and lower, and then only the lower, and then now it's catch and release everywhere. So, But, but the policy seems to have helped. Yes, yeah, so yeah. It, it took a little while, it lagged a little bit, just needed time to get things going, <laughs> and then here, uh, this is definitely the area where it's just been catch and release throughout the entire system. Yeah, I think that, like, mid-92 is when they have that slot. Right. Yeah, yeah, there was a slot somewhere in there. Um, so how does this compare to some of the other systems? So we do the same snorkel surveys on the St. Joe River, too. And so this is the St. Joe kind of comparison here. Um, one of the things to notice that the there was a few more of the, the fish densities were a little higher earlier on. Um, it seems to be that there was... A, contingent of people that were already practicing catch and release back in that in that time on the Joe that didn't take a hold on the, the quarter lane for quite some time. Um, but you can see even in this more recent time on that upper figure that the Joe and quarter lane kind of track together um, and that tells us that it's largely nature's kind of playing that role of that variation and the trends 
Um, same thing here on the, the lower panel with the larger fish. One thing to note is that the biggest difference between the Joe and the quarter lane is that the Joe just seems to have a higher capacity for a higher density of larger fish. And I think largely that's a, a habitat a factor there in the Joe. There's just, it's a higher elevation stream, more cold water. Um, it's got the deep canyon section where it's got large pools that can house a lot of fish. Those are things that we don't really have on the Coeur d'Alene, the North Fork Coeur d'Alene. It's a lower elevation, um, not as many deep holes um, throughout the system, which we'll get to some of that here in a little bit. So I also threw this one on here too. So if you're kind of wondering, oh, these two systems have had harvest seasons, there's been hatchery, rainbow trout that have been stocked over top of them throughout history. Um, so there's been things that have gone on. So what do these compare to uh, a system that hasn't had any of that? And so I threw the Middle Fork Salmon River, which looks like I got cut off there, but the orange is the Middle Fork Salmon River. This is a wilderness area. It receives a fraction of the use of the Coeur d'Alene and the St. Joe, and that's mainly because it's a wilderness area. The only way to get there is foot, horseback, plane, whitewater boat. So very few people fish it. Um, hasn't had stocking. The habitat is largely untouched in as nature intended it. So what we can see from that is there's still variation, annual variation is gonna happen, um, but we're doing okay in density wise, which I think part of that has to do with our cold water that we have in these systems. The middle fork can get a little warm at times. Um, but anyway, so I thought that was, that was good news. We've got, it seems like a fairly, at least healthy enough population of cutthroat in the North Fork that given the right conditions can, can grow and grow, grow well. Um, but there are certain times when this annual snorkeling, snorkeling data doesn't give us the exact answers that we're looking for. And that's where we, we can, when opportunity and priority kind of come together, we can start doing some fish research projects. And these are more labor intensive. We have a very specific question that we are trying to answer and we can devote some resources to it. Probably one of the most notable ones that we did was in the early to mid 2000s. Uh, for cutthroat, we did a telemetry study. And this was really to look at and evaluate the movement of cutthroat in the system. They don't always stay in the same spot. Um, and then some of the mortality and what habitat are they using? Um, one of the things that I, we're proud of and, and I'm sure the folks that were involved in this, because I talked to a lot of them and they remind me that they were involved with it. It's, it was a really awesome collaborative project that was state, federal, um, corporate, private individuals. There was a lot of folks that were involved in this. So there's a lot of people that were very interested and got involved, which was cool. Uh, but instead of going into all the details of it, um, one detail is we used a, a radio tag, which is just a little transmitter that was surgically implanted in the belly. And then you could actually go out with an antenna and track that fish to the exact spot and in certain cases, they actually put on snorkel gear, went in and found that fish to see, is it alive? What's it doing? What habitat is it using? Is it under a log? Things along those lines. Um, but some of the key takeaways that we learned from that is one of the things with habitat is that there is a, a degradation of overwintering and summer rearing habitat for cutthroat in the North Fork. Um, also, another thing we learned is that there are, and it's just kind of unique uh, to the North Fork, there are some serious cold water inputs, and meaning springs that are popping up in the river itself. Um, and uh, some of the tributaries are really cold as well. And those were very important for cutthroat, which kind of led to a few years after the study was done, the Forest Service uh, was lucky enough to get some thermal imaging of a good section of the North Fork so that we could get images like this here um, that actually shows the color is the river or any water along the river and in the river. The brighter colors are warmer water, the dark colors are colder water. And this really was helped us pinpoint some of those cold water inputs where they were in the system so that then we can match it up. Okay, what did we see in the telemetry study? Where were these fish going? And we were pairing it up that those fish were utilizing a lot of these places, these cold water places. So in this instance here, we've got the river going upstream to downstream. River is probably about 17 to 18 degrees Celsius, but then you get this spring 
and the cold water plume that's going along the shoreline and that spring is about seven degrees Celsius. So it, it's pretty significant uh, cold water coming in. And same thing here, you got a slough um, that's got some really a cold water spring. Um, I'm sure at high flows, this connects. Um, and as one thing we know, there's the only thing constant about a river is change. And then I'm sure during some years, this is, this is completely connected. Um, so fish do utilize those areas. Those, they find those cold water springs. Um, snorkeling, you see it. You'll be snorkeling through some warm water and you're not seeing anything. You hit the frigid cold water and you shiver and then all of a sudden there's just a hundred fish right in front of you. Um, so it's kind of, kind of neat to see. But with this information, what we were allowed to do was, was pinpoint these areas. And that's kind of where our habitat protection started coming into play. So since this, the thermal imaging came out, it allowed us to prioritize these locations. And we've been going out and actively seeking to either outright purchase land to protect these habitats or work with a landowner to do a conservation easement. And one of the first ones that we did was, was the Katie James conservation easement. Um, basically this conservation easement, it's that the land is still owned privately, but there's restrictions on development on the property to protect um, not only the cold water inputs, but other habitats that are important to cutthroat like side channels. Um, so, and this, this one here was purchased in 2012 uh, and uh, it's 17 acres, it's about two miles upstream of Enaville. And there is a cold water spring on the property as well as some side channel habitat. And so with the thermal imagery here, uh, we can see that this Holtman Gulch Springs is got some cold water coming into it and it doesn't show up here, but it does connect and cutthroat had been utilizing that side channel. So this was a nice piece to protect. Uh, this was the first first one. Um, one of the things though that we were we noticed right away was that we were only getting about half of the springs. Um, so we really focused in on trying to see if we can get the rest of the springs uh, protected. And luckily mm -hmm. in 2020, we were finally able to outright purchase a 36 acre property that adjoins the Katie James. So there's the Katie James piece. And so now Fishing Game owns all of this here. Um, which now protects all of that, that gulch. Um, and of course, some side channel habitat along, it, along the river as well. This one's not quite as, as uh, I guess, fancy, um, but it still protects some habitat. So we acquired a, a 11 acre piece. This is one mile downstream of the Katie James uh, property. And so that cold water is flowing through this section. And we were able to acquire this piece of property. Um, it was undeveloped, uh, but it's in an area that had been actively been being developed. And so we were lucky enough to get this piece. Uh, it was actually from Idaho Transportation Department uh, who owned it first and uh, then we took over. Um, the one thing that we did do with it, uh, because there wasn't any like immediate cold water um, springs coming up, we were able to put in some access, which was sorely needed to in that area for floating and waiting. Um, the boat ramp's just a primitive rock gravel, so it's about as least, the, the least amount of impact as you can have. Um, but again, protecting some of that cold water that's flowing down from the Katie James uh, easement area. And then another one that Again, habitat protection. So this is a, an island that's five miles upstream of Vinaville. It's about 18, 19 acres. Um, part of the motivation was not only is this a braided stream, uh, a braided section of, of the river. Um, you've got a, a channel here, a side channel, and another side channel, and a bunch of sloughs and, and stuff that fish really, really go after. Um, there was a neighboring island. Um, right before we got this one, kind of provided some of the motivation too for getting this that was completely developed into an RV park. And they put a bridge through the side channel, a road bridge, uh, an automobile bridge. Um, so we were just trying to, okay, there, here's a nice braided section. Let's try to protect this one as well. Um, and it does provide some fishing access uh, by foot only. And this kind of leads into where we are now and some of the future things. This this piece has been in, in the works now for a couple years. These easements and acquisitions, um, it's a long drawn out process. 
and this is one that will probably take a while as well but it is well worth the effort they all are well worth the effort this is a 133 acre waterfront property um, 103 acres of intact floodplain habitat from that telemetry study uh, when the water rises and these floodplains get inundated those cutthroat will move up in there to get out of the flow so they don't get blown out so that's one of the reasons for for eyeballing this piece but out of all of the cold water inputs, this one has the largest and coldest source that we found in that imagery. And it's where well, the arrow's pointing to this little, little side channel oxbow lake right here. And it's pretty jarring. Here's the river at about 18, 19 degrees Celsius. And it comes down and right where it meets, where this uh, cold water meets the river, it drops it almost two degrees Celsius. So that one spring is completely changing the temperature of the entire river. So it's a very, very important piece that we're, we're actively working with the landowner um, in, the, in those conversations. So I'm hoping that sooner rather than later, we can get this piece also protected in some sort of way. That remnant oxbow used to be the main channel. Mm -hmm. And then it plugged in. Yep. It's like an elk cave in there too. <laughs> yeah. Elk and moose. And yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful piece, a piece of property. It's, it's gorgeous. Like right where the river, where it connects in the river, that student from U of I that did the backwater channel surveys, they would snorkel out during the day and at night. Oh yeah. And basically what, what they found is during the day they're up in the cold water and at night they move back into the river. Yeah. And the river cooled a few degrees and then back into the Fugia. And I will say, kind of go back to the Freeman's Eddy and the importance of, of places like that, even though it doesn't have cold water actually coming out at that site, is when you're snorkeling and you hit these really, really cold, cold pockets like six degrees, those fish a lot of times aren't directly in that cold, cold water. They're finding somewhere down below that's more optimal for them. Um, granted, they will go up in there as well, but uh, for the what we see snorkeling, you, you'll see that. You'll hit that cold water and it might be 100, 200 yards downstream before they find that right temperature that they like. And then kind of moving away from habitat protection, uh, one of the other things we're working on is this Pritchard Creek habitat restoration. This is, uh, if you're not familiar, the legacy of dredge mining going on where the Pritchard Creek itself is highly degraded in stream and in the riparian area. Um, in fact, the porous substrate from the mining makes the creek completely dewater and throughout most of the summer, disconnecting it from the upper reaches of Pritchard um, to the North Fork. Um, the other added benefit to that connection, if it does happen again, is that Pritchard Creek is a cold water input to the North Fork. So if we can get those connected, that means more cold water going in for the fish in the North Fork. Um, this is owned by the Idaho Forest Group, and they've already put 2,000 acres in a conservation easement, and that actually includes about three quarters of Pritchard Creek itself. So that is, that is huge, and they are right out there with us um, doing, doing work. This is a cooperative, collaborative effort between Idaho Forest Group, Trout Unlimited, DEQ, and, and fishing game and, and other folks. There's there's a lot of people that are interested in this. Um, what fishing game is doing, our, our role in this is that we're providing the fish monitoring. And this is really to assess how the fish respond to the restoration work as they continue on. This is kind of a long-term project. Uh, we plan on, we've already added some snorkel sites for annual monitoring, um, but we also do more intensive Basin-wide monitoring. Last year, uh, a bunch of us, including DEQ, Trout Unlimited, Forest Group, we all went out and we did a bunch of backpack electrofishing, much like what the Burp Crew does. Um, and we spread out through the entire drainage and got a, what we call a good baseline of information. So no work, no restoration work had been done yet. So now we have the information to compare future surveys to. Uh, we haven't solidified the period, like how often we're going to do that but probably in that like maybe three to five range um, but that could change depending on how fast restoration work gets done does anybody know they're annually monitoring temperatures putting a thermograph in 
I believe so, yes. And yes. My belief is, is when we pull that water to the surface, you're going to see the temperature go up and measure it. It, it might go up, yes. yes. So right now it's all that inner gravel hypergradient flow. Correct. And that other place you showed is the same thing. Mm -hmm. Once it goes subsurface, the water cools up 5 to 10 degrees. So that would be interesting that or some needs to continue to monitor those temperatures to see how that's going to change. So we did deploy a bunch of temperature loggers from the mouth all the way up see so we can track that change too. We also do, uh, we take temperature whenever we snorkel as well and we have sites above yeah. the dewatered section and below so we can see that as well. Um, I have found that at least the, the sites that are above are still pretty cold and then you get down below and there's it's actually so cold we don't see many fish. Um, and not until you get further down where they find that kind of optimal temperature right. that they like. Um, especially right there where Eagle Creek comes in, there's a deep hole right at the bridge. You'd think that thing would be full of fish and I haven't seen one there yet. <laughs> um, we've comboed with burp data. So the last couple of years we're out there annually with Pritchard Creek. So collecting more data. Yeah, yeah. And that's the bug data and that'll help hopefully. Definitely. And they're, they're monitoring groundwater data temperature cool so i'm really excited about this project and can't wait to see what happens here in the future with it it's really cool um and with that we'll see if this actually works here we tried tried to see if we'd get it work to work but while we're uh we have well, to count fish. yeah while we're taking questions <laughs> there, so this is a video that i just took uh in the uh fall as last fall uh, late October, and this is one of these overwintering pools. And I just wanted to kind of show you how important they are for our cutthroat and other species. It's deep water, um, which is they they migrate to these deeper holes, and that's where they stay for the winter. Um, and you can kind of get an idea of how many fish utilize these, and why they're important, and why we need why we need them out there on the landscape. But with that, I'll take any questions that anybody has. Can the questions become something that has nothing to do with that section of the North Fork and launches? Sure. Okay, because you guys, you know, obviously you're working really hard to get this other launch in, and that looks like another good location for it. Um, the Oxbow area, was that it? The, I'm assuming you're going to do something for access there? The, uh, the one all the way yeah, up north? Yeah, 15 mile. I don't... That's not in the not in the, oh, the talks not yet. Um, there is one access that we're actively working on, but it's uh, below Enaville. It's the old junkyard. Well, hallelujah. Junkyard. Yeah, junkyard That's what hole. we want to talk about. <laughs> so we're, we're working with the landowner right now. We have them now for a, year, a little over a year. Yeah. Land prices have made conversations a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, just the work we've done mm -hmm. in the last couple of decades, we've spent uh, uh, almost so three quarters of a million on oh, easements yeah, and, yeah. and uh, just land acquisitions alone. Um, so as prices go up, we have to find more people to kind of come in and help. Okay. Um, but we're, we're getting there, we're making headway. Um, we're always actively looking for, for locations for, okay. for access. Um, so yeah, we're working on that. that something I've been wondering, I think we've all been wondering. Well, my question is though, I talked to Andy about this last year when they just kind of slid she, in and dug that out. The, and you didn't have any permits for anything. Bastille just past the mm -hmm. jump. Yard. You're talking yeah. about that private access. Yeah. I think they're talking about something different. Oh. They're talking about the junkyard. But still, you're, Rob's they're right. Adjacent. Yeah. That act, yeah. Rob's absolutely right. What happened to that there's never been any remediation and there are fish habitats in there that you know where the guy privately decided to dig into that bank i'm sure you're familiar with it it's right next to the one yeah i, I don't know what's been done since then um i know in other i know in others other instances where we've seen people do things uh they they have been um contacted and had to had to fix what they've done i'm not sure where that is in the process i i don't i don't know anything. unfortunately i i, I, I don't know i i tried to work with everybody and i i feel like i'm getting stonewalled everybody's gone well they need to take care of that you need to take care of that 
but nobody's done it. But nobody's done it. needs remediation, and the guy, yeah. There's got to be a remediation done on that site. But everybody's pointing the finger at everybody else. Yeah. We just wondered, where's the... Where, so where's that at? Because I talked to Andy about it a year ago. Yeah, Andy would be the best... Best and source that's for that. What I and about, and I can nothing take it back to him and, and see, what, see what. Yeah, I'd appreciate it's, that. From a, t a window of time standpoint, that impact that guy did privately. Uh, fortunately, we have not had high water in January or February, which historically we could have. Yeah. We will have some high water coming May, April, whenever it decides to come off. That site is going to go right over the road. And, and, and that part of the road on Riverview floods all the time just about now. every year and with that being there it's just creating a public hazard i think well and we had fly fishermen calling us as they were going by in a guide service saying you know this guy's in the river right across there you know it's right next to the junkyard launch cutting in to, to get across to the little island and he's got his excavator in the river and the fly fishermen are taking pictures going what the heck you know this guy a, you can't get around him and he's very aggressive as a lot of them are and so what are we doing about that nothing it hasn't changed i've heard oh we shut him down well you shut him down but it needs remediation that was a really lovely spot for the fish you're, you're for bringing that up yeah the, the, the junkyard lack of a good technical term, hole. <laughs> Everyone knows it's a rabbit hole, whatever you want to call it. Uh, are you looking at to acquire that island, or are you looking just to to just the launch, or, or what, what's the scope of your plan? Still in conversation, and that's kind of, the, the idea is to have a launch in a parking spot for people to park their boats that's not along the road or anything like that where it's a safety hazard. Good. So where those conversations lead, I don't know, and that's still in the air. So uh, we'll have to kind of see how that plays out. It's been a long yeah. time. That one's been working. Yeah, that, that one's been sitting there almost a year now. Oh, I mean, really? it's coming up on that. And it's coming up on spring. Yeah. So, because I've lived just up off Riverview, and right where that thing is, that part of the road floods every year. Exactly. And with them putting that in, it's taken away that uh, it takes away that barrier mm -hmm. when they cut down right to the river because it's going to come right up that where they try to put that launch in. We've sent the pictures. We've sent the pictures yeah. of how bad it is and also the guy in there with his excavator doing it. And, you know, what's, what's going on with this? Because if we really care about these waterways, and we're not just collecting data, and the data's fabulous. You guys are amazing. <laughs> I love, and I'm a research fanatic, so I love that stuff. But we have to have actions that balance out, you know, what we've learned in the data to go forward. Kind of like what we saw at Terry Harwood, I always liken back to his incredible years of, you know, research and action, research and action. So what can we do about this kind of, because it's going to happen more and more, especially and this private. I think that's a, a great segue. First, thank you, Carlos, for a great presentation. It's great to see how research has informed your easements and the habitat protections you guys have acquired over the years. Um, before we move forward, because this is a, it ties in really nicely into the field trip discussion, just to touch base about that. Um, are there any questions about content that Carlos presented, both in person and online? No, I, it, it, your research is spot on. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. I like that thermal imagery. Yeah, that was really that cool. That explains it was, a lot. It was yeah. huge. Yeah, Absolutely huge. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Carlos and Craig, once again for giving an overview of the great monitoring in this area, um, which is going to tie really nicely into our next two meetings, 
um, which are going to be outside and in the field visiting some great restoration projects that um, have happened previously and are going to be breaking ground this summer, um, the Pritchard project that Carlos mentioned and that has come up in these meetings before. So um, we have some dates set aside and I have some little save, save the date flyers um, that you guys are welcome to hold on to. Um, pass around and you can share this with anyone you think might be interested in coming. Um, I'm going to send out an electronic version and a follow-up email as well. Okay. Hopefully I printed enough. I printed more of those in the agenda, so um, we should be good. But we have our first one coming up on um, Thursday, June 22nd, and the second one on Thursday, September 7th. Um, Details are still to be determined as far as what time we're meeting and where we're meeting. Um, but the big idea is for part one of the field trip in June to visit Moose Drill and Bottom Canyon uh, Forest Service restoration sites. Um, and I'm working with, I'm going to start working with Wade and Chris and Will and everyone to figure out those details. Um, and then the second part of the field trip is going to visit Albert Walsh's property along the North Fork and then try to see some on the ground construction with the Pritchard Creek project because they should be starting this summer. Um, and hopefully we can fit in a bird crew on one, on one of those just depending on how timing works out of all that. So um, because it's, we're still quite a ways out from June, um, keep an eye on your emails. I'm going to be sending the information your way and asking for some RSVPs just so we can get a head count and manage the number of cars that we'll have. Um, and that's pretty much all I have as far as updates for the restoration field trips. So we're not going to have, those are our next two meetings, and then probably in November or December we'll be back in this room. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Well, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it should be a really good time, and hopefully the weather holds out for us. Um, moving on to the next item on our agenda is a septic subcommittee update. So just to uh, provide a little recap on our last meeting, there's a lot of community concern about septic tanks and black water, gray water from campers going into high, going from high density camper situations into the river. Um, and that's a very valid concern. We have Brian here with Panhandle Health who can help answer any questions we have. Um, and so we formed, to, we proposed the idea of putting together some, what we call the septic subcommittee of just a group of folks who are interested in what, what targeting this issue. Sure. <laughs> um, and we, we, that name can be um, debated or changed to whatever you want. Um, and agreed to add it as a standing agenda item for these meetings, so just to touch base and see where things are at and how the group can be supportive. So, um, Don, I'm not sure if you would like to take over or... or I would like to do this. <laughs> get out the shovel. Um, well, I'm not sure why you're asking me to take over yet. We kind of chit-chatted a little bit about what that involves, and, you know, I, I don't know, you know, if that means visiting locations to see what are you doing, why don't you have blue rooms, how, who's pumping, who's doing what, because we know that with the population, recreation especially exploding, that there's a whole lot of things going in the river that can pump along there. So we're trying to figure that out and how you want us to handle it. And I have a couple more questions before we even start this. You know, we have a phenomenal amount of data from you guys for the fishing game and BBQ and everything else. It's spectacular. Do we have any data what's going on with this? With the septic and, and water quality and do we have maps associated with it? Who has a permit to be there and are they using the permit? Uh, have they abused the permit? Do we have any information on that level? Because it's tanks, not just... RV people. It's 50, 55 gallon drums too who's, that are buried who's in Who's monitoring the flushing? Who's monitoring the refills of those tanks with fresh water at the end of the season? You know, where, where's the oversight on that? What, and what happens Is when you have a high handles? flood here and they float and they move right. out? That There's seems a like a flushes. lot of questions for right, right now. So how about we just pause right there? Um, <laughs> we have a lot we think Ryan, about that. do you have any, any insights to that? Um, Sure. <clears throat> Any new construction requires septic permits. Right. And Idaho has 
very detailed rules on how septic systems can be installed, especially when concerned with uh, limiting layers in the soil like groundwater and bedrock and stuff such, and as well as surface water. There's definitions for um, temporary surface water and permanent and intermittent surface water, and they all have different uh, setback requirements. So when we're on site permitting septic systems, you know, we're taking all that into consideration. Um, as far as campers go, you know, if, if somebody's got a camper and they are using their camper without subsurface sewage disposal, they're just using their tanks. I mean, we're not, we're not going around and checking everybody's camper to ask them what they're doing with their wastewater, if that's what you're wondering. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't have the ability to do that. No. What I, what, we have a lot of old septic tanks along the area that have been grandfathered in. Permits are continuing to be you know, issued for ones that are way too close to the river. And that's, I can count I, I can tell you that, that immediately. I have um, not issued anything that's too close to the river. Okay, what's your version of two, how many hundreds of feet? 200 feet, 250 feet, 100 feet? It depends on the soil type. That's why we go on okay. every single site and we look at test holes. Okay. We evaluate test holes, maybe in multiple the test holes. In the we floodway. do not, we, we don't have rules based on flood plains. Um, this, the counties have rules for building in flood plains or, or however that, that term works. Right. We're not issuing septic permits in areas that are getting flooded every year, if that, that's kind of what you're wondering. Yeah. Oh yeah, really? they yeah. have. Maybe not you personally, maybe you've only been at it a few, maybe a year or so. I mean, I've worked um, at the health department for six years. So. Okay, but have you worked on site doing the permitting um, up and down the North Fork? Yeah, I've I've worked in Shoshone mm -hmm. County for the last year, and I'm okay. aware of okay. I'm aware of sites. Okay, I I want to stay okay. away from personal. Right. Well, no, it's just we're trying to get a handle on for sure. Who yeah. is who is going to be um, involved in this process? Pan yeah. So Panhandle Health District definitely has a, a great handle on permitting for septic tanks and they have their whole strategy and rules that they need to follow. So there's well, a problem. Uh, we're long standing. Who's walking after the permit? After is what we do. You know, we went through, we built a house around the Coral Lane River. We went through the whole nine yards of Panhandle Health. You know, we did the ultimate design and check and everything else and yada, yada, yada. Does anybody come back and check it after the fact? No. We do final inspections after the. No, I'm talking about stuff. five years after it. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, after we, it's flooded. We issue septic perm We issued over 1,500 septic permits last year. 1,500 permits the year before that. Do we don't have the staff to check up on? That's what we want. There's. To, I mean, we have yeah, over 100,000. Idaho doesn't have a regulatory system. For that. Right. That's. We're, I, I don't I mean, know of any. Property owners have that. their rights, and you're not going to have people. Brian's not going to go into someone's house and see what they're no, no, no. the toilet. No, 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 no. So. We're not suggesting that. What we're asking about is what, what is in place, particularly in the recreational issue, whether it's in campers. You know, I know that there is some kind of regulation about blue rooms and how many you need per acre or per camper or something. Isn't that for those recreating? Those pan but you said Panhandle doesn't get involved in that at all, right? In, in if it's what? recreational campers, you know, like up the North Fork, you see on one acre, sometimes, you know, 10 campers and one blue room. And they, those campers sometimes never go anywhere. For, yeah, we're not, we're not checking months. on parcels. So, if they have a couple of outhouses there. No, okay. that's not what we're doing. But people that pump those, we monitor uh, and inspect those pumping trucks. And yeah, that's, no, that's I know. We but we're not, we're not going around it's looking for outhouses. Making sure are. that using them. Okay, because I mean, we are seeing dumping in the river, and that's what our concern is, is that we're seeing people are, you know, <laughs> so, using the I river mean, I, as a dump. I can't be everywhere at the same time, so if you're seeing stuff like that, you should be calling it in and filing Absolutely. Uh, complaints on Absolutely. Like I know we did one last two years ago when Ed Pomerani was still, and he is, was the one who caught them, um, doing it there into the South Fork right before Enoville, and there's just times when you think, my goodness, you know, what what is the repercussion is I guess what I'm curious about. What is the, you know, is it 
nobody, everyone just says, don't do that again? <laughs> or is there some kind of um, repercussion? At our, at our last meeting, we, Ryan and um, Jason spoke to this and mentioned that enforcement is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Catching violators and enforcing mm -hmm. um, is a whole other beast. So navigating the, the rules of government that Panhandle Health is operating within is very tricky. So I would like to suggest that we redirect our energy towards what can we as interested community members in this group do? What educational opportunities are there? What we, we talked about maybe trying to get another pump out station. Right. Um, what's the current use at the pump out station at Kingston and the Forest Service pump out station? What's it called? Base camp? Um, yeah. Are there new technologies that could be explored? Yeah. There are a lot of different avenues that we can we can take beyond focusing on all of the problems with rules and all of the loopholes. So I just I wonder. Well, help us navigate that then. Yeah, because I, I think that's a great idea. I think our our goal is to make sure that there are um, you know there's repercussions for this kind of thing. I, sure. You need to if we really care about our waters and and the fishing and hunting that take place around them. This is one of the biggest factors affecting them. Right. So um, something we were talking about at the last meeting was what kind of use the pump out station at Kingston gets um, on a typical weekend in the summer. Um, does anyone have any insight to I'll that? I'll talk to him. Okay. My understanding is he's kind of not able to provide any right now. Sure, if, if we could um, Which, learn more about maybe the challenges he's facing, that would probably help inform some potential solutions. And, and what this. fraction of the users, the people who right. should be using it, are actually aware of, mm -hmm. and aware of it? Mm -hmm. so exactly. As you said, education may be the mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, and, and I totally exactly. agree with you with the yeah. education. Mm -hmm. So but, that seems like a, a great next step, at least. Um, to me, based on these conversations, does that seem like a reasonable path forward? Just to learn more about the current situation and what what would help improve it? If, if another pump station would even do anything, if people don't even know about the pump station at Kingston. Well, he's, they know about it. he's got issues, yeah, he's got issues with the sewer district and the water district. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's not something that is going to be easily solved. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way, as none of these issues are. We know none of these things are easily solved. We're all just hoping to, you know, make it a healthier place. But I do think asking that kind of question, it takes five seconds. You know, Rob will stop by, talk to Rich, find out what that is, but we definitely need more of those stations. Okay. So we know that. I don't know, we don't need to study that, we know it. <laughs> okay, great, so, so then the next step beyond that, I think the challenges we identified were location, funding, and long-term maintenance. That's what I had written down from our last meeting. Yes, yep. So then we would have to start working on that. As far as location, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone does. Um, maybe we could look. I'm unfamiliar with how with where the base camp forest service pump station is. She's shown it. Way up. Okay. Way up. Way up. Way up. Way up. Yeah. Too far up. Yeah. You so got maybe one way up the river and then you have one in Kingston. Mm -hmm. Is the forest service able to get involved and help us find a location because they own most of it? You know, the locations would be, we would need them to designate like with a vaulted toilet. We need more of those. You know, where can we located and you guys have more input with them than we do so who can get involved in helping us call the forest service and say let's scout let's go look let's test this area let's see if it'll you know take that kind of um because i know just putting in you know vaulted toilets and dump stations is going to take some serious testing of that particular location soils and all and kind of a to piggyback on that idea um it was mentioned to me, Kaisa, when she used to run these meetings, mm -hmm. when she was in my position, I think she was tossing around the idea of a designated recreation area with like a season pass fee type thing mm -hmm. to help fund, I think a, it was a dumpster in that particular situation. Yeah. Um, and maybe some more forest service patrol. Um, does anyone have 
a better recollection of that than, than I do. We weren't coming to the meetings then, but I, I know that we need to do that. So maybe those, those two could be combined and get more momentum. Um, so as far as the Forest Service, um, <laughs> any ideas on? <laughs> well, we kind of have all the players here. Hello. Uh, oh, hi. Hello, Say bye. Is there someone online? Yes. Oh, sorry. Hi, Jedediah. Hi. Here, let me bring hi. you over. So, I, I'm your friendly neighborhood forest recreation manager. So, the North Fork of the Coeur d'Alene is mine oh. in terms of forest service and recreation. I preface that, though, in that I have been here for a whopping six weeks. <laughs> and I'm Lucky also guy. not actually here full time yet. I'm in the process of selling a house in Twin Falls and buying a house up north. So I'm kind of doing this like 50 50 sleep at my parent in law's place in Spokane and commute into Coeur d'Alene on a week and then go home for a week or two and try and sell a house. Anyway, so I know nothing, <laughs> just prefacing everything there, but you, you do have your forest service rep and the person who does all things recreation on this call. Um, Can we get your so I'm, I'm intrigued to find out that there is, or I'm, I'm intrigued to learn if there is a need for additional pumping or excuse me, additional, um, Black water clean out mm -hmm. dump stations. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of a funding source, I I think the most expeditious funding source that I can think of in the state of Idaho is probably the Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation uh, RV Recreation Vehicle Fund. Mm -hmm. uh, that grant process is. It's every year, it's very consistent based off of RV uh, licensing fees. Mm -hmm. And a land manager, like the Forest Service, can apply every January, end of January, every year for projects that benefit RV users. And putting in a dump station as completely unappealing and unsexy <laughs> as that sounds, yeah. um, everybody poops, everybody pees, <laughs> and no RV user <laughs> likes to haul their black water any further than they absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. So um, putting in additional dump stations from a funding standpoint, I don't, I see the, the state, the IDPR, probably being pretty supportive of that sort of thing. Um, assuming we had the location, assuming we had the engineering and, you know, all the paperwork, the NEPA, um, all squared away. Great. That would be wonderful. Yes. Lord knows. Thank you. Me. That's really good input. Where, where can we reach you, Jedediah? <laughs> you got a cell so, number? <laughs> uh, hopefully starting uh, sometime next month, I'll be full time in the Fernand um, oh, Ranger Station in Coeur d'Alene. Okay. Um, Let's see here, but uh, I'm happy to throw my contact information in the chat, cell phone and uh, email, if that works out great. for everybody. Thank That'd you. Great. Thank you. Do really you can you um, speak to what the limit, like what's the maximum amount you can get on those grants? Hmm? Can people hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Jedediah, the grants that you were talking about. The top of my head, I don't have a max dollar amount, but I've put in for grants that are, you know, for double um, CXT concrete pit toilet or vault toilets. And I mean, those are $55,000 a pop. Mm -hmm. So when you throw in the installation, you're getting more into like $75,000, $80,000 a pop. So, um, you know, when we're talking about a dump station, I'm complete ballpark, yes, but I'm kind of like in that 100,000 plus range. And I would imagine that an RV grant would probably most that. With those, you generally have to match. Um, so coming up with labor or other organizations that are 
you know, whether that be the Forest Service or Friends of groups or whatever, but basically piling money in and coming up with like anywhere from like a five to fifteen percent match. Great. And you, you you can't have federal to federal match, right? If it's federal dollars, you can you match? Oh, sure you dollars? can. I'm sure you can. This, this well, is we, normally don't, we normally don't have money, so. We don't have money. 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 We don't have there, we cannot have matching dollars on that program with another federal money source. So I'm thinking maybe the 319 grant program may, would not be eligible as a match to cover any additional expenses on the more expensive pump outs. Well, the RV dollars are state. Yeah, yeah right. this RV grant, it sounds like it's state dollars. Oh, it's state, okay. Then, then you could match. So if you didn't have enough, you could you could coordinate it and get other sources of money, mm -hmm. such always, as 319. It's always sources. Yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that and, and bringing this grant to our attention. Felicia, you, you've had your hand raised for a while. Do you want to add to the discussion? Yeah, I was just going to add that like anything up further, there's just not a sewer district there. So keeping that in mind, there's no connection anything it would have to be like a subject type which is brings in the same problem we've been talking about um but just to keep that in mind and kingston sewer district right now is working on some upgrades to their system they don't have the capacity to take anymore right now right. um they may after they do their their big land application upgrade um but that's something to keep in mind as well but this grant doesn't look like it has any um maximum ones. it's granted over 50 million dollars it's saying so I mean, definitely something worth looking into. Um, and it does look like you could do some in-kind work as part of that 20% match. So. Awesome. Just more thoughts. <coughs> really good. Thank you. You know, the question is, the sewer you, to, you might have a septic issue if you put a more remote one inside of the sewer district, per se. Whose responsibility long-term could that be to pump it? Well, that's what she's saying. No, no, she's talking about being able to go down there. But could that fall into the Forest Service responsibility for maintenance? Could it fall into the county's responsibility for maintenance? <clears throat> I guess with that, that would depend on the land that it's on. Yeah, as far as the yeah, is concerned, if we're yeah. issuing a permit for a RV dump station, they they don't have a like a, a leaching field or a drain field or whatever right. they get pumped um so you put in i think the minimum size is like 2500 gallons for an rv uh, dump station you can put much bigger than that and they have um, alarms um so that you know when they're mm -hmm. getting full um yeah and then you pump it out but as far as like where the health farm is concerned whoever is the property owner would you know kind of in our eyes be the default for mm -hmm. the responsible party in that but I'm 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 sure if that wasn't the way it went, and then the, uh, maybe the the county wanted to uh, ensure if it was like some sort of county thing, or if some other group did it. Um, as long as there's some sort of entity responsible for it, I think that's for knowing all. when it's time. Yeah, yeah. that's I, all we really care about. In the about. Clearwater, they have a rotational; they just automatically go. At least the guys we've talked to, and and whether the alarm is sounding or not there's a guy who goes by every week and checks measurements and things like yeah. that as he's doing the cleaning and the pump outs and yeah i don't know what they do up the joe because there's that one in avery i'm not sure if that gets pumped or if that's connected to whatever avery does i don't, I don't actually have any know. idea mm -hmm. um kristen kristen sent a nice message in the chat i'm just going to read it out I suggest the purpose of the septic subcommittee is to meet prior to the next meeting um, to flesh out some more solutions, questions, concerns <laughs> brought up in this meeting and update the WAG for the next Watch meeting. Out. Then the WAG can help influence solutions and build momentum. So do you think, is Friends of the River willing to meet about this topic and to kind of brainstorm yeah. on yeah. these solutions out of the WAG meetings and Absolutely. to come back? Okay. Yeah. And, and, and our whole thing is we just didn't know 
Sure, yeah, I mean, we just talked about it for the first time at the last right. meeting, so it's it's We're still fresh for all of us, that. for well, sure. Well, when is the next meeting? Because I, I like that idea, meet ahead of time. Yeah, um, so I guess the field trips kind of throw things out of whack. Um, we can maybe meet, I can meet with you guys in the interim about this specifically, um, because I'm not sure we'll have time to talk about this with our field trips. Um, so it unfortunately wouldn't be until November or December when we're back in this meeting, we, back in this room. So we can meet, um, I can meet with you guys and be talk great. about it. Because I can, I, or, okay. so Lily, I, I can talk Lily, to you. I need to interject. Mm -hmm. Lily, I need to interject. Okay. Um, the reason why we did the subcommittee is because DEQ is very resource limited and we cannot facilitate subcommittees no, um, we are not just facilitators. That's why there's subcommittees. So I would be, I would suggest Lily that you don't take the lead in organizing this and getting, getting things the momentum. I hear you, Kristen. Yeah. Um, if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, it wouldn't be like this WAG meeting, spending right. two hours talking about the septic. Right problem um, but I'm always available to answer questions I, I think our thing is we just need some guidance mm -hmm. on just to get going on where yeah. we're supposed to go with this right yeah because, it, it's okay if the, 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 it's okay if the agency folks volunteer you know to I mean they'll cut they'll be available when the questions are raised and the concerns need to be discussed in the subcommittee but um, we we're not gonna we're not gonna facilitate it. Um, but we could be available. I'm not saying you guys go off and um, back into the um, realm of not understanding and what do we do. The agencies can be available, but you guys facilitate and have the issues you want to discuss in the in the um, subcommittees, and then it can come forth to the WAG, and it will influence, and then the WAG can speak about it, and the momentum will build. So you will support us in our work, working within the agencies in order to accomplish this, not just like, oh, well, yeah, okay, wherever you're thinking of putting that, that's great, but we don't have time to deal with that. Uh, we, we need to know we're gonna have the ability to really get your, your involvement and input on with locations and just how to go about this with, especially Jedediah, that's, you're probably going to be our number one, you know, no pun intended, go-to. So that's why I'm thinking let's, you know, we, we definitely need to meet. But I hear what you're saying, Kristen. We don't have the manpower to, you know, basically be involved with you guys day in and day out. And we're not asking for that. Yeah, but we, we will support within our jurisdiction. I'm speaking for DEQ. The other agencies can talk, um, but I believe that we're all... Um, in this together, we just need to be smart with our resources of, of time um, that are limited, resources and time that are limited. So we will make ourselves available when it, your questions and concerns and um, um, are within our wheelhouse. We'll definitely, or even, I mean, not just that, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. I do. All, all we're asking for is a little bit of guidance and help. Yep. That's it. I think no that's more, great. No and it, and it, it'll be way more effective if you get together more than um, in between the WAG meetings. Yes. So we're not trying oh, to get caught up with. Yeah, that's great. Us and as then, and then all the people that just create the subcommittee and the agency support that you need. And I, I, I promise there'll be momentum. Okay. As long as we have momentum, because we need that. We need that validation from you as agencies in order to move forward, even with the federal government. Great. Um, in the interest of time, I don't mean to cut this off short, but we have a couple more things to talk about and we can recircle to this before we all leave um, at the end of this meeting. Um, next on the agenda is open discussion. And we did have a request from Ed. Yeah. Um, do you want to just go ahead and talk about it? So I spend a lot of time in the woods, and um, I found 
plug culverts in the past and I'd call a district ranger who's now in the Virgin Islands or something. <laughs> and the next time I'd go out and that culvert still plugged. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'd like to see if at one of the meetings if the if the state lands and the Forest Service could come in and make some presentations on what their um, road maintenance program is and what their plans like Forest Service I worked for them a while back and we would we had the five levels of roads we had when it would be brushed when it would be bladed and there's roads that you can't drive now and when you walk them they're rutted mm -hmm. and um, I, I think that type of impact is sending sediment to our lovely river mm -hmm. and so I'd like you know I haven't you can't even drive up Shishon Creek anymore it's, you know, or else you're going to beat your truck to death so I'd like to see what what their plans are um, and I did some research that basically says Idaho BMPs, um, Idaho Forest Plan all requires road maintenance to meet the Clean Water Act and to meet Idaho State BMP. So um, if they could bring something like that in as to what they have, what they're doing, that'd be great. And we could have a discussion off of that. Am I the only Forest Service rep on this uh, call? Uh, no. No. <laughs> no I, okay. Yeah, I was just making sure everybody would be taking notes to uh, get all this back to, to Ashley and, and Josh. Yeah, I can I can talk to engineering Ed and see if we can have somebody come to a meeting and speak to that because I think it was a complicated issue. Yeah. Um, I will note this down as an agenda item for a future meeting okay. and get in touch with Chris um, and I know some other state folks who could probably weigh in on that as well and try to get kind of a panel together. And I can get the ranger's phone number from Wade so <laughs> next time I'm out in the woods and I see a blood call that I can call. There you go. I'll hear it. Are you going to call the one in the Caribbean? Or? <laughs> <laughs> He's definitely out of the picture now. Thanks for bringing that topic up. Um, are there any other questions or topics that we haven't touched on yet that anyone would like to mention? Anyone online? Okay. Yeah, hi Lily, it's Rebecca. Hey. Um, just curious if there's any talk of a Clean the River um, event, or what were they called? I know the Friends of the River were involved, but um, um, every year they had a big river cleanup. I didn't know if the community, if you've heard any rumblings. I have not. Well, we try and set it up according to the right time of year for the water being low enough and enough volunteers available. So like the first year was in July or August and then the next year wasn't until October because of the flow and again, volunteer people, all of us trying to make ourselves available. So, oh, that's that will be happening again. We yeah. didn't design and build that vessel for nothing. <laughs> When that does happen, um, I can send the info out to our email list if, if you're interested. That would, that would be a great thank help. you. Huge help. Huge help. Thank you, Lily. You might and we will, we, and, and, and we will try to keep you updated. Well, I can even give you just a little bit of an update from what's happened the last year, the last two years. On that, the, the uh, what's, what's the uh, uh, foreground for actually coming up with this cataract for tire extraction and other trash associated with it. Apparently we have multiple dump sites from the past, specifically beyond the confluence downriver. And uh, um, there was one major one, which was the Enoville dump site, which is just upriver the new bridge. Uh, and that has been capped over. However, the residue 
uh, or wherever you want to call it, that dump site has washed down the river primarily to that big island we're talking about, the junkyard hole. I don't well, know why they call it the junkyard hole, whether it's from the junk around the, the hole or <laughs> within. But anyway, and then it, and I, I can make reference to this we floated and have extracted almost 3,000 pounds of tires already out of this tires, river. Yeah. And uh, as we go down below the, the, this confluent area of, of, the, of the junkyard hole, and all of a sudden the, the, the refuge of tires and everything kind of disappears. There's nothing there. It's about a mile section, just nothing there. And immediately, as soon as you have human access back into road access to uh, the North Fork, or the, it's a core lane right now at that point, uh, all of a sudden we get more dump sites and, and uh, the trash just picks up and apparently from uh, uh, the CCC bridge road access on that side, down river all the way, all the way down. There's just dump site after dump site after dump site. And, there's and uh, uh, we, we haven't even scratched the surface of what's going to be pulled out of that thing. We need to definitely let way more volunteers to jump in on that because especially strong ones. That's something divers we've only got the one diver and we need we, we'd like to design more than just the one vessel uh, in order to you know pull but again that takes funding and see where we go we may be putting in septic tanks <laughs> we do what we have to do with the funds so yeah um Jennifer had a, a question in the chat asking if either of the field trips will include opportunities to see potential septic pump locations. Um, just based off of the preliminary planning, I'm not sure we would have time to incorporate that, but um, I'm definitely open if it works out. Um, right now, that, that is not currently slated for either of the field trips. Right. Can we get a hold of you in the chat? So um, we have about 15 minutes left in this meeting, and at the end of every meeting, um, we have project updates from the group to see if there are any programmatic updates or events that folks would like to let everyone know about. About. So I'll just pause here and see if anyone has anything that they'd like the group to be aware of. You can update Richard, Creek. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so the Pritchard Creek Restoration Partnership um, Restoration Project is about to get started on phase one. So that'll be just below, I think it's the Four Square Bridge, downstream towards the Coeur d'Alene River. Um, they'll begin construction this summer, put in a lot of large woody structures, just trying to increase floodplain habitat. Um, pretty big step, we're pretty excited about it. Um, it should expand a lot of habitat for cutthroat trout, at least up to the portion of the river that has surface flows during the summer. Um, aside from that, the um, Trout Unlimited and IFG just went out this week to dig big pits and the dredge piles just to characterize the sediment and get an idea of what's in there. And me and Lily went along too and took some metal samples. So we snowshoed probably about 30 miles and carried buckets of soil back and forth. Um, so we'll get some metals characterization too. Uh, that way they can come up with a kind of get a game plan and get some alternatives for the dredge pile. See if it's feasible to do a restoration project there or how to best handle it. Um, but it's pretty exciting. At least there'll be some on the ground work to improve trout right. habitat. Right. So you're able to disturb the dredge piles because historically those were um, national monuments or historic yeah, sites. Yeah, it was a checklist ship out. Yeah. But it's all about boring them. So basically, just dug a hole and then put the rock right back where it was. But can you restore them? Because, like, up above, oh, you like fishing you green, when they redid um, the road up over the top, the yeah. Thompson Pass, they couldn't touch dredge piles. Um, I know it's been done in the past. The Crooked River had the exact same situation, and they completely removed all those. So, it'd just be working with the State Historical Preservation Society. Um, we'd already talked to them about some of the other projects too, and they were able to work in that area and remove some of the old historical features. Which the ship has history on that course. But that's also a consideration too. Is, you know, I mean, those are a historical monument <laughs> to mining, so there's lots to evaluate coming up. So, how much silver is in them? 
we we did find a hole that looked like it was native soil, so there were some people pretty excited to go back and you know see if there might be a little bit of gold in it. <laughs> I actually did when we were receiving it. I did take it down and I panned a little bit with water, and I didn't see any you know dust no color at all. <laughs> No, so, it was just all like granite. So if you and Lily buy new homes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, back in more buckets now. Here's how you know I didn't buy gold. I'm here. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if Bill, Bill's, oh yeah, looks like Bill's still on this call. Um, Bill, do you want to talk about the open position with the district? I don't, I don't see any action. Um, so I can go ahead and talk about it a little. Uh, Katie Yoder usually comes to these meetings. Uh, I forget what her title was for the Kootenai Shoshone Soil and Water Conservation District. I think it's the Idaho Soil and Water yeah. Conservation yeah. Commission. Yeah. Yeah. Rebecca, do you want to talk about it? No, I was just going to say the same thing. She was with the commission, not the district. Oh, the so commission. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so she was with the Conservation Commission. Um, she has accepted another job opportunity, so that position is currently open, but they're hoping to fill it sometime within the next month or so. So that's one update. And this position provides technical support and assistance to the local conservation district. So mm -hmm. I think um, for this area, be the Kootenai Shoshone Conservation District. Any other project updates? All right, well with that, um, normally we would find a time for our next meeting, but we already have that figured out. That's gonna be on Thursday, June 22nd. Um, details will be emailed out as we get them solidified, so keep an eye on the email for that. Um, and with that, thanks everyone for a great meeting and um, looking forward to seeing you all in June. Good, how are you doing?